I come from. I come from blood fruit mango, cashews, frozen fish fingers, dirty dishes, and council gas heaters. I come from concrete and coal, spaghetti bolognese and shiny new BMXs. From tea tree oil, marijuana vapors, the damp heat of laundrettes, holy jeans and molded Mary bottles of made in China, holy water. I come from a world of miniature, of powerlessness, of oversized furniture and scruffy trainers, free steps to mummy's one plastic dinosaurs and power rangers. I come from the motorways, my friend. From the same journey three times a month, like some weary old heart that takes a week to beat, to beat out our old battered blood cell red fear, compelling it to crawl over the spinal cord of these British Isles just one more time. I come from heartbreak, no more formally viewed underneath the withering eye of the divorce court's bisection of these bicuspid valves, the crack in my heart widening into a crevasse. I come from rainbows and thunderclouds, from ladybirds and dragonflies, from fighting with fireworks on streets, Hop, skip, hope to miss the syringes. I come from steel and sandstone, asphalt and coniferous forest. I come from sweat, smell, and the invisible world of chromosomes. I come from the warm pouch with umbilical cord. I come from that first prehistoric spark of enlightened consciousness on an East African plain. I come from the dense nuclei flung from the wounds of stars. But in the end, I concede and say the least needed of me. I come from. I come from, I come from Leeds. I come from new broom sweeps clean, but the old one knows all the corners. So brick by brick, I rebuild a house that once stood in Chapel Town. 56 Carper Street, a Victorian terrace with a green front door. My grandparents' home, where I'd slide down staircase banister into laughter and now in memory. I try to remember all things special. I come from grandma's homespun rules and grandma's looser apron strings of do's and don'ts and decencies where chores were regular and never shrinked for skipping ropes, playing jacks or hot rice, where skylighting carried the repercussions of stand up straight, pull your socks up, never mind the playing outside with them children, go inside and go find a book and read. I come from Four Gaythorn Mount, our house. Mines when grandma released the rains, where cooking pots crowned the stoves top daily, where, smums, where smells of mum peeling back onion skins, grating fresh ginger, mixing spices to season up meat, where life moved with a looser reggae beat. I come from young hearts that shake hands and cross cultures where feet masquerade in time to the heartbeat. I come from Harold's Middle School where Bolsville kids um, wore dance shoes and danced and clapped in the playground. I come from oats porridge and hard old bread and a sip of herb tea for breakfast and I remember where I remember to wipe my mouth at the bus stop on Round Day Road where I walked a short Grace Jones Afro style black girl pride channeling my steps. 
I come from Chapel Town. I come from a place where we never imagined the night rage would burn cars and shops, rioting a stone's throw away from my house, where big youth and men and women raised up a passion, set out the street like an arena for a bull fight with the Babylon. I come from UK, black British music, where sounds, where we claim the sounds of mixing soul and gospel, and black America and the bass line and the drum talking out of Jamaica, where you can't hold us down for. We are players of music, we are dancers, we are singers, it's just how we do it. I come from a place where it discriminates. I come from a place where the teacher said, I lack imagination. I came from a place where racism was ripe. I come from a place where school discriminated against me, where I was the only black child in the class, and the teacher would always write a report that she doesn't mix well, we don't know what to do with her. I come from a place where they say failure is the only way forward. As an African Caribbean black woman, I was told that I could never, ever survive. So can I get the, the slides? Is it this? Yeah. Well, I was told that I could never, ever survive. So today, I'm connecting heritage through the work that I do. So you guess that I'm a poet, and you guess that I do poetry. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the intro video. But first, we're going to rewind and come again. Senkofa style. What does the rewind come again, Sankofa style? Well, Sankofa is a bird, an African adage found in Ghana, where the bird is walking forward, but his head turns back. So the importance of that is that a people without knowledge of their past is like a tree without roots. Marcus Garvey, who is a hero of Jamaican culture. I come from a place where I was told that I couldn't do anything. So when I left school, I really believed that I couldn't do anything. So I followed the trend, and I was pregnant by the time I was 16. And everybody talked about me and said, she's a failure, she's never ever going to do anything. Because I fed into what the teachers said, I fed into the culture as a young black girl. But I had a very, very strong grandmother who said, new broom sweeps clean, but the old one knows all the corners. So using the Sankofa bird, I looked into the past to look at my history and decide that there's certain things that I need to do. And one of those things was to not only um, raise the children, I have three children now, and my eldest is 28. So we're going 20, 20, 28, 20, and 17. So not only am I a poet and a live artist and a director, born in Leeds, but I'm also a mother. And I always remind people of where I come from. So that's why I just read a little bit from a collection called Roots Running. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So having that inside of me that I was a failure, I was a teenage mother, that I couldn't do anything, and I came from an environment that considered young people as failures, I needed to do something. I needed to encourage myself to develop myself into something that I had an interest in. So I founded Summer Grassroots. Well, first I went to university to prove everybody wrong that actually, yes, I was young. Yes, I may have made a silly mistake, but there's something else that I could do. And actually, by the time I went to university, I had three children. I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts with honours um, with Arabic and Middle Eastern studies. I then went on to do my master's degree and then I founded Summer Grassroots in 2001. And then in 2003, I founded Lead Young Authors and Voices of a New Generation, which is a poetry slang organisation. And that was based on my children, my children being the inspiration, my children being the thing that people thought was negative. I turned into something very, very positive to empower myself as an African Caribbean woman who faced a lot of discrimination and ended up being married, then single. So, yes, young with a child, but then getting married and proving that, thinking that I had to do that. But actually, I realised there was more to my life than just being married. 
It was more to my life than just having children. I was this writer, I was this poet, and I was always writing poetry at school, but the teachers ignored it, and it wasn't until I actually um, did a very, very strange thing. Had finished school, so I wasn't pregnant in school, finished school, had a child, went back to school, to the sixth form, a new school where I met a wonderful woman who said, I bet you write poetry, and I said, yes, I do, and she really introduced me to a lot of writings, of like Maya Angelou, writings that I wouldn't have been introduced to regular in school, and then I said I could do that. So then in 2008, I believe, my book was published called Roots Running, and here are the comments that some people said, these marvellous poems, and I thought people are writing this about me, these marvellous poems, you know, that are driven by the speech of Jamaican Yorkshire, we've got Arabic in there, because I studied Arabic, and I spent a lot of time in the Middle East. When I was doing my degree, part of that I had to go to the Yemen for one year and I took three children to Yemen. My husband went with me and then decided that this was not for him and he was actually leaving and left me in Yemen as a student with three children and I stayed. Everybody said, oh, you need to go home, you need to go home, go back, to, go home and, and um, don't finish that degree. Maybe the best thing for you was to stay at home with your children. I stayed in the Yemen. When I went to Yemen, not much people knew about that place. I went in 1996 and my children went to school there. I came back and so a lot of my work as, a, as someone that has a Jamaican heritage, born in Yorkshire, also incorporates that language because I didn't want to waste that degree at all. But also, the benefits of being an artist over the years is that no one could imagine that when my mother, who kept my school reports, often reads back and saying, they said that you was a failure, that you would never ever achieve or amount to anything. Do you think you can find your old teacher and show them, <laughs> <laughs> and show them what you've amounted to? So I thought I'd do uh, the benefits of being an artist, which constantly I get phone calls, can you come and do this, can you come and do that? Sometimes I say no, sometimes I say yes. And it's really about what I, have time to do, because I'm still a mother with three children, I'm still a single mother with three children, still raising them and watching them grow, and watching them go through university and college, but yet I can still do all of these things. So some of the things that, some of the great things that I think that I've achieved was when I went to Al Guna, the writing residency in Egypt, that was 2010, they offered places to 17 writers. I was the first one to be offered that place. I was the first one to get to Egypt and do the, the writing residency. And then there was a number of people that followed afterwards. I felt that was a great achievement. Someone coming from Little or Leeds, you know, going to Egypt and being able to do that. But also um, being involved, I'm very passionate about the environment. And I'm very passionate about, as a writer, what is my contribution to the environment. So I was part of a project where I went to Martinique, the French West Indies, and I incorporated poetry and looking at green spaces and writing about green spaces and then bringing that back to Chapel Town where I live. And I'm still striving with the council to say, let's develop these green spaces, let's have uh, fruits and vegetables and poems in there so when people walk by they can actually stop and say actually this is a nice space and there's a plaque here and we can read the poem. So some of the great things that I've done, F Words Creative Freedom was a tour of the UK and the USA and really being able to share some of those poems around the experience of being a black British writer. I was also part of the Five Women Poets new collection where People Tree Press was celebrating five black British poets across the UK. And it was really great to be selected amongst that. And so part of that was that we had to tour and share our work. And I felt that it was really important as a poet to not only to share my work, but also inspire other people. Um, hair stories is always an issue for me because as a black woman, hair is an issue. We've got this thing about bad hair. We've got bad hair because we've grown up and been told, oh, your hair doesn't do what our hair does. What does your hair do? And as you see, I have got dreadlocks in my hair. So it's always a constant discussion about, is that really your hair? Can, you know, what do, do you wash it? You know, um, do you comb it? Well, actually I don't comb it. 
but I do wash it. And, you know, so I felt that I needed to do a story around black women and their hair and the empowerment of the Afro. Because when you change that, when you change the structure of African hair, you weaken it. So the story is about the strength in African hair. So when you see people like the beautiful Beyonce on the stage, who has become an iconic figure for many, not just black girls, but white girls as well, across the globe. The thing is, for white girls, they can do their hair like that. But for black girls, we can't. So it's either a wig or a weave. Now, the problem with the weave is that it's weaved onto the hair and it breaks the hair and it causes traction alopecia. We have a generation of black women such as Naomi Campbell and Tyra Banks who suffer from traction alopecia because as models and people that are in, in the spotlight, they constantly have to have their hair changed and they've been told that the blonde hair is more beautiful and more attractive and so on and so forth. So Hair Stories really was about breaking the stereotypes and really telling the story, celebrating black hair and black women and the power of our hair. And also I'm a visual artist. I don't do very much of it, but I work with the visual artist Olo Shea Ogunjabi and we created a series of batiks which were an installation piece that stood in the um, Zion Centre in Manchester and then also in the Leeds City Library and also um, Leeds Metropolitan when they used to have their theatre section. <coughs> and also the, the Hair Stories collection is also visual arts as well as storytelling and it's interactive so you can touch, you can read about the problems that we have as women with our hair. Um, Jafaya Burning was also an opportunity to work with Lee City um, Council and the museum to talk about black culture in the arts, working with a range of people. David Hamilton is one of the most outstanding dancers um, that's come out of Leeds, but also around the UK. If you know Phoenix Dance Company and if you know RJC, um, if you know the history of Phoenix and the history of RJC, he's both the founder of Phoenix Dance Company, which then he went to RJC and founded RJC Dance Company and he's someone that is still around today um, performing and celebrating the whole culture of dance, not just, not just black dance, but the whole culture of dance and how we can inter intertwine dance and poetry. So this was really a great moment for us as artists to be able to show that work um, called Your Fire Burning. Also, this is talking about some of the benefits of my work, F-Words. Also, F-Words was, I mentioned it earlier on, we um, had an opportunity to um, talk about what was happening, Britain's role in the slave trade. Still today, Britain's role in the slave trade is very rarely talked about. And we feel as black people, it's very, very important. It's important because if it's talked about, it will quash discrimination, stereotypes and racism and actually it will bring Britain to account to their role that they took in, in slavery and the way that it changed the whole structure of the world. So I talk about being born of Jamaican parentage but originally my family would have come from somewhere in Africa. I love the whole thing of heritage and connecting and I often sit down and watch things about the royal family. And people are very surprised. You watch things about the royal family? Yes, I do. Because I find it's very interesting that they can connect their heritage and they can go through, you know, who was born when, who came in this world. And I can't do that. And I feel quite sad. And maybe even some of you might be able to talk about your family trees and you might be able to take it back five, six, seven, eight generations. People like me, we can't do that. It's very, 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 very difficult because when we take it back, it goes to a point of slavery. And we believe that our history is far broader than the enslavement of African people. So we had the opportunity in F Words, Freedom Words, to talk about those common issues. And it was really interesting to work with people like Romy Smith and Jack Mapanji and the range of other people and Carol Phillips to be able to celebrate what has happened in the past but commemorate and also bring Britain to task to one day that they will actually apologise for their doings and realise that actually the impact, the aftermath of that still survives today. 
Linton Kwesi Johnson, one of Britain's most celebrated um, poets, um, one of the first or the second poet to be published by Penguin Classics because they usually publish dead poets or dead writers. So it was really an honour to be able to really share my work with someone like Linton Kwesi Johnson and really be able to kind of talk about some of the, the things that we, you know, that we face as poets, as black writers. This is just more things. So um, celebrating the end of the slave trade, it wasn't really a celebration, it was a commemoration of that work. But I was one of two writers in the city of Leeds to be commissioned along with Michelle Scully Clark to work in several schools and it was the first time that Leeds had actually um, brought writers into the school to actually talk about the issue of the slave trade and moving on. So it was a really fascinating project. But also as an academic, I also had the opportunity to um, give lectures. And we, um, last year, Jane Cortez, an African-American um, poet and writer, came to Leeds and we looked at the changing nature of black culture and politics, 1960 to 2010. It's long and it was broad, but it was really an opportunity to, to be able to talk about some of those ongoing issues that we face as black people in Britain. And some people are tired of it, oh, chip on your shoulder, why do we always have to talk about that? Then we, may, we could say that to the Jewish community, why do you always have to talk about the Holocaust? Their response to that is that, so people never forget and never repeat the atrocity. And it's the same for that in terms of the enslavement of Africans, but also what's happening today with child slavery and the selling of children across various continents. So we dealt with some of those issues today. Now, lead young authors, really what I wanted to talk about. Looking back, and using the adage of the Senkofa means you have to look back in your history, but you also have to move forward. And in moving forward, it's important to be able to share an element of your skills. So what I decided to do in 2003, based on, it really started with my son being in, the, in his bedroom in the attic, and I could hear him rapping and emceeing, and I was like, oh, he's probably just listening to a CD or something like that. And I went into his bedroom and he was pretending he had this mic. And I was like, you know, his name's J.D. I was like, J.D., what are you doing? You know, and he got really embarrassed. And I says, oh, did you write those lyrics in that book? He was like, yes. And I realised what he was doing is imitating his mother in writing. I think you, you have to be an inspiration to children, whether they're your children or the children of the community. There was a saying, it takes a village to raise a village. So the village that I believe I, I live in is, the, is Leeds. I see Leeds as this village and it's my responsibility to help to raise that next generation. So let's start, I started with the very important thing, my home, my family, my children. And I said to him, if I put on workshops, do you think that your friends would be interested in doing some writing? And he said, definitely. So put on the workshop and within a week we had 15 boys at first that came down to participate in the workshops. The following week we had 30 children, a mixture and what it was, the rumour went around, if you come down to this workshop, it didn't have a name at first, if you come down to this writing workshop you might go to America. <laughs> Because I thought, how come we've got all these kids? But it was my son that was saying, you might go to America, because he knows that I often work in America. And he actually put that idea in my head. So actually, I was heading to America that same year to go and do some work in Chicago to help do an inset program of my poetry. And they were celebrating black British poets. And when I talked about it in, in the school, and the teacher said to me, you need to go and speak to the young Chicago authors, for our namesake, lead young authors, you need to go and talk to them. They're doing amazing things with young people. So that's what I did in my time in Chicago. And the lady and the West said, this is amazing, Khadija, what you're doing. You've got 30 kids within two weeks. You must bring them to America. <laughs> so I felt like that my son probably had this insight already. So the following year, we brought several kids to the United States. And before I talk about that, I just want you to understand what Legion offers since 2003 to present, what we do. So we run creative writing workshops in and out of school, 
yeah, to develop youth talent, to encourage social inclusive, to engage young people and really to promote the benefits of good writing. To help young people, not, it's not just about the poetry, it's really about engaging them in literature, engaging them in reading, removing them from the TV and the video games. Sorry, video game player. <laughs> no offence. <laughs> because um, it has its place and I think it's also important, but also to look at limited times in which they engage with the TV, in which they engage with a book. Many young people do not read. They do not read the newspaper, they do not, read a, they do not take a book up. They might read the gossip magazines and we said that's a good starting place. If they're reading it, let's talk about what's happening in society. So it's really encouraging them to speak up for themselves. So we do a workshop called Truth Facts stereotypes and we look at the whole image of stereotypes of young people the image of females and males and what their roles are in society and in that we develop inset programs within the schools and outside the schools. so these are just some of the schools that we've worked with over the years and I've, i had to do a count the other day that we have worked with um over 25 schools in the last 10 years, which doesn't sound like a lot to some people, but it's a lot for us as a voluntary group, because one of the things that I didn't mention is that we don't get paid. And the we is myself and my co-worker, Paulette Morris, who's a singer-songwriter. So when we first started Legion Authors, we got the young people to come down, and then luckily enough, um, the host media centre where the workshops take place said, we really like what you're doing, and we've got a job going, for a year, can you really do some, can you really encourage young people to come and use this space and also the communities come and use this space? So that's how it really started. And then when the year was over, we said to the kids, right, the funding's finished from the Arts Council and you, there's no more workshops and don't come back basically, because there's no more workshops. The following mm -hmm. week, I got a phone call. Can you come downstairs, Khadija? There's a bunch of kids waiting to do a workshop with you. And I said to them, didn't we say that the workshops were finished? That was our last workshop. It was like, well, what are we supposed to do? And I looked at my co-worker and I said, right, we don't have any money. This job is finished. Nobody's going to get paid. She says, well, we can't turn them away. So we took them into the workshop and we worked with them. So in 2004, until present, we basically work with young people every Tuesday, six till eight, doing creative writing, and engaging them in the art of poetry slam. So this is some of the things that um, we've done. We do an individual poetry slam. For those of you who don't know what a poetry slam is, Google it, go online, see Legion Authors. We also do a literature festival that celebrates young people in the art of writing, as well as a teen poetry slam. Now the teen poetry slam differs from the individual because the team one is working with the schools and community projects and they work as a team, whereas the individual is an individual that will come and say, I've got a poem and I want to do this competition. What this individual competition gives them is an opportunity to go to America because we had to figure out how we were going to take kids to America and what we were going to do and how they needed to prove their worth. So basically they participate in a poetry slam and it's not basic poetry they're writing. It's really fantastic poems. As you heard in the first one, the opening sequence to We Are Poets, it's amazing poetry that they're writing. Why? Because when we take them to America, it's a culture shock. Americans are very big out there. You know, their personalities are very big. You know, everything that... We have small refrigerators, they have big refrigerators. We have a small sandwich, they have a big sandwich. Their personalities are like that, and it can be quite intimid intimidating for even the most confident young person to see that energy on the stage. So we have to really support them through this process and also through the team process. I just want to say with this work, 2012, during July, this work went national. And this work based on the work that we do with Legion Authors, there's two things that happened. We had the great support of someone from the Arts Council called Jane Stubbs. And I can never ever forget this woman because she believed in what I was doing. When I had to explain what a slam was, nobody understood. But she believed in what we was doing and she really pushed forward that work through the Arts Council for us. And that work really grew and promoted that. 
the work went to London, it went to Manchester. Because we're such a small organisation, the Arts Council decided that because the Olympics was going to happen, this would be a great time to have a national slam. And people had to bid for it. We didn't get the bid. Even though we're the lead in Poetry Slam, we didn't get the bid. The bid went to London, which was not a bad thing. We held a national competition with nine regions. I just want to say that out of those nine regions, when we went to London, the Yorkshire region won. Yeah? That is an amazing achievement out of nine regions. And that was enough for me. I thought we didn't get the bid, but we still won. And we still showed them that actually we're very, very good at this. We've had years and years of practice with this. Um, we also do um, an awards ceremony and we also have an under 13s writing group. So we actually have three writing groups. We've grown from one writing group to three writing groups. So the You Get Me Under 13s are essentially our under 13s pupils who want to come to Legion Office as we're 13 to 19 and um, we run workshops for them. So by the time they get to 13, they're ready to join the workshops. And then we have the Metaphonetics, which are our 18 to 25 and they work with us in the schools and we also develop them as young mentors. I just want to say in finishing that Legion Offers were the first to participate in Brave New Voices, the International Poetry Slam, the first non-Americans and the first across the board coming out of any international country. Yeah. In 2009, we, the, play, the team placed second out of 52 teams, which was amazing. And also, just the outstanding reputation that we've had so far. In 2010, the World Cup National, we won that. And also the film documentary, We Are Poets, also won an award. And We Are Poets, which, oh, got an extra slide there. It's the lead team in Washington, just to show you kind of, we have to always re remind the Americans that we come from Leeds and not London. <laughs> Yeah, because they go, oh, you're from London, England. No, we're from Leeds. And they'd say it's the same thing, and we'd say, no, it's not. Yeah, so we'd always wear T-shirts saying we're from Leeds, and we've gone there with a chant saying, you know, we're from Leeds, UK, West Yorkshire, not London. Can you remember it? And we, and we developed this into a whole chant. The We Are Poets, just to finish, the We Are Poets documentary, um, next screenings, this is some of the dates that we've got. But can I just say from 2011 to present, the We Are Poets documentary has won several, even I can't remember how many awards it's won, but um, it recently won an award in Berlin for the best opening sequence. It was shown on Channel 4 for the, one of the best opening sequence, which is what you saw. And it is in colour, it's just like it showed black and white today. But also that it's touring not just locally, not just regionally, not just nationally, but internationally. So we feel very, very proud that the work that we started in 2003, or should I say the work that started in my son's bedroom in the attic, has developed into something that is critically acclaimed. I went to, um, to San Francisco this year and I met several poets from New Zealand who said, We've heard of Legion Authors. This is all the way in New Zealand. We've heard of Legion Authors and we saw that documentary, We Are Poets. We think it's amazing. We get emails from France and Italy, people saying, we've heard of this, we've gone online. So we feel really, really proud that this, um, the screening of We Are Poets is still touring. If you want a screening in your organisations, just Google We Are Poets, because I've done a really sad thing. I've not put the... the um, the web address on there but basically it's www.wearepoets.com and you just email and you can get a screening and a workshop in any of your venues for any events and really i'd just like to stop there and say thank you very much indeed <laughs>